Life in remote eastern Zimbabwe has changed little over the centuries. That is, until a startling discovery here three years ago. This one is uh, you can sell them for $20 a gram. This one, so this one is seven coins. Some of the rocks littering these plains turned out to be diamonds. The man who's showing them to me is a former policeman turned dealer who I'll call Mishek. He's agreed to take us to the Marange diamond fields, but he's worried about running into soldiers. <laughs> As a white woman, I'm too conspicuous, so it's agreed he'll take my Zimbabwean colleague who'll film with a hidden camera. It's a dangerous journey into an area tightly controlled by Zimbabwean security forces and off limits to the outside world. We're going to use public transport because we think that public transport is uh, uh, less scrutinised by the police. Um, and then when we get there, uh, we're going to walk in the bush uh, for two and a half hours uh, and it will be night by the time we get there. And... At first light, my colleague starts filming. He's already made it past three security checkpoints but they've had to walk much further than normal to avoid detection. And I thought the journey was going to be two and a half hours, but now it turns out to be almost six hours of walking at night. But anyway, we're almost at the area. Um, just in front of me are three buyers, the guys who I'm going with. What we're doing here, we're looking for a base. A base is a sorting area where diamonds are sorted from the field, ready for sale to the buyers. This is Marange, the world's largest find of alluvial diamonds in more than 50 years. <laughs> On the edges of the diamond field, these children are sifting through soil, hoping to find a stone someone else may have missed. <laughs> At night, the military's own syndicates and those willing to risk going it alone dig for diamonds. In the morning, it's time for the buyers to move in. This is the sorting field where we are right now. Uh, and the guys are busy sorting their diamonds. Diamonds from here are distinctive in colour and the oldest in the world. A huge amount of them are pouring out of this area, worth an estimated $200 million a month. How much can you sell this one? $70. It's not just individuals working these fields now, but also the Zimbabwean government. While it's impossible for us to openly film here, Dateline obtained these previously unreleased pictures of the mechanised mining being conducted by government agencies. This is organised theft. Organised theft from African Consolidated because they're mining on, on African Consolidated mines. Andrew Cranswick is a Zimbabwean and chief executive of the British-based mining company which holds the mining rights to Morungay. His euphoria at the big fine quickly vanished when he tried to enter a joint venture with the Mugabe regime. Three weeks after the company declared the discovery, there was a surprise visit from the mines minister, 
followed by a blunt eviction notice from security forces. We were told, listen, if you're going to refuse, the guns are going to come out and you're going to get ar arrested and you're going to get harassed. So literally, here are the guns sitting in the truck. Do you want to stay or don't you want to stay? The company's equipment was seized, its employees locked out. And he says more than 25 kilos of diamonds vanished. The Mugabe regime then opened up the fields to the people. That's before, also before the rains. Then the diggers and the rains got on pretty much the same time. And that's what it looked like afterwards. You notice the trees... Within the weeks, these fields were swamped with ordinary Zimbabweans and miners and dealers from further afield. Here's a picture of an illegal crowd coming in. Uh, that's, that's a South, South African, African number plate. Um, these guys were coming... The uh, youngsters from the village were selling bottles of water. A bottle of water, a diamond. So it's quite extraordinary what is happening. Cephas, as I'll call him, was one of the estimated 15 to 20,000 people drawn to Chiadzwa at the start of the stampede, paying a commission to police to be there. Like many people in this story, he was willing to talk, but only if his identity was protected. Cephas says he watched as Reserve Bank officials arrived in Chiadzwa to buy gems from one and all. Did we know the value of the diamonds in Chianswa? That they can look after this country very well without even looking at external. Uh, uh, um, uh, borrowing or something. Tribal leader Newman Chiadzwa says that while many community members were at first willing to mine for the government, that soon changed as the police abused their power. For instance, if you take the diamonds confiscated from me by, by the government, <clears throat> it was uh, uh, over 10 kgs and that 10 kgs were only produced in, in one week by by less than 20 people. And I, I can put an estimate of around about $15 million worth of diamonds which were confiscated. $15 million? $15 million US dollars. One five? Yes, because half of it were, were, were gem quality. At the same time, Zimbabwe's political landscape was also changing. President Robert Mugabe was being pushed into signing a power-sharing agreement with his political foes. Without the patronage of the army, he looked like losing power completely. That was the era of hyperinflation, and, and you could you know, walk around with wheelbarrows of Zimbabwean currency and still pay nothing. So he needed some way to continue to buy the loyalty of the Zimbabwean army. Ken Roth is executive director of the internationally respected Human Rights Watch. He believes Mugabe devised a plan to keep the army on side. And what better way than allow units to rotate through Morongue, get their two weeks at, at, at picking up diamonds and selling them, and he thought that that would be a perfect way of maintaining the loyalty's backing, the, the army's backing of, 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 of Mugabe's government. But first, the military had to gain control of the fields. In late October last year, Operation No Return was launched. Farai Maguwu from Zimbabwe's Centre for Research and Development has been investigating what happened next. The first week of November marked the turning point in these atrocities which were being committed by the state security agents. This is a time when the military replaced the police. When they went in, what was their brief? What do you think they were ordered to do? And they were ordered to kill. They were ordered to kill. Zimbabwe's helicopter gunships launched a massacre, according to scores of credible witnesses. Human Rights Watch and eyewitnesses say hundreds of people were gunned down. Cephas says he was there. Why should I have a helicopter? 
Nepas. Why don't you shoot at him? He could play his farmer. You saw the good person young guy when the woman would pass. You and the woman had a pass with Zika Majoshi. Human rights investigators say this photo shows one of the many bodies that began accumulating in hospital morgues. And as I got a by what would it? What was him? I shall go out with it. When we do as Ungo Toronto, I made we are in Nippon. I made we are a twisty, I wrote a good Hamea Odin. I ain't go see a chit. I'm taken to a cemetery on the outskirts of Matari. It's close to an army base, so we have to move quickly. Human rights investigators have uncovered a paper trail tracing the bodies from Chiadzwa to morgues and hospitals, and finally to this spot. These documents reveal scores of unnamed bodies were brought here. A lot of it's unknown. Mm -hmm. That's why on the cause of death, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's written in a in a unknown. Mm -hmm. this and yes, you see, unknown, unknown. A lot of these papers are unknown. Mm -hmm. These two men are too frightened to be identified, but they show me to what they say is the cemetery's grisly secret. This was the grave where the mass grave where eight or five people were buried. Right. Yes. Were you here that day? Yes, I was here. What did you see? Uh, in fact, uh, there were prisoners from uh, Mutare Farm Prison who, who prepared this uh, grave, and they are the same uh, prisoners who passed away. The true death toll is not yet known, but Human Rights Watch say it's uncovered proof of more than 200 deaths. Local researchers say it could be double that. And they believe blame for the massacre can be traced to the highest levels of the Mugabe regime. So a lot of people saw what happened here? Yes. And the authorities deny it? Yes, the authorities is denying, but it's, it's true. There are people, I think, uh, uh, if at all it is allowed, uh, we, we can uh, exhume the bodies. Yes, exhume the bodies. They are there. Mm -hmm. You can't deny. Uh, you know, the truth is truth. The people okay. are there in the in the graves. You're still seeing victims. We are still putting together evidence because we believe action has to be taken against the perpetrators of these gross human rights violations. And just two days ago, we interviewed a woman who was mauled by dogs in November. And until now, she's, the scars are all over her body. This is that woman, a 58-year-old widow who says she was attacked on her first and only visit to Chiadzwa to sell clothes to the panners. With helicopters in the air, police and soldiers on foot and on horseback, the dog squad was also set loose. Eyewitnesses say the violence and shootings continued for weeks. Those detained were beaten and tortured and women were raped. This woman, who does not want to be identified, had also gone to Chiadzwa with clothes to sell. Throughout the entire security operation, no civilian was above suspicion, including those living in the nearby city of Matari. So, first session, give or take 12 or 12, 15 strikes. The next session, maybe eight. When I still felt, felt pain, the third session, maybe another eight or ten, and I had no more pain.
67-year-old Carl Woods is a former farmer and now bauxite miner who was arrested on his way home from work one night. He says that for two days he was held in a cage along with scores of others. He was only let out to be flogged. I regard myself as being abducted from a police station in Mutari, taken straight to the police, uh, to Chiazwa for, for floggings. When they asked me in Chiazwa, are you a diamond dealer? That's about all they could ask me and no more. They beat me if I, when I denied that I was. Hospital records confirm the months of brutality on the minefield, which eventually left it fully under military control. But soldiers were soon providing more than security. Hundreds of illegal miners were organised into syndicates to mine for the military. According to an actual syndicate member, as each new military unit arrives, it takes over the mining teams run by the departing soldiers. Yeah, syndicate I touch with entry to the district now severely restricted, Mugabe's ministers deny the massacre and other human rights abuses ever took place. At this mining conference in the capital, Harare, the nightmare in Chiazwa is far from people's minds. Zimbabwe's new unity government is trying to paint a rosy picture to attract foreign investment. I cannot overemphasize the advantage we have in the mineral wealth. What we crave for is the capacity to exploit that wealth. Obert Mampufo is a Mugabe loyalist and recent appointee to the position of Mines Minister. He's told Parliament only three people died at Chiadzwa, victims of internal strife, and he's unrepentant about the government's decision to bring in the military. No, we moved in, and we don't regret having done that. We moved in through our police we were supported by the military because of the magnitude of the invasion by the, the, dig, the diamond uh, panel. And that has been achieved. The panels have been cleared. Authorities at every level continue to proclaim their innocence. And President Robert Mugabe insists that all mining in Zimbabwe is totally above board. The sanctity of property rights and the rule of law in all its dimensions are fully respected. Andrew Cranswick would like to believe Robert Mugabe, but watching this video filmed recently on his claim, he's shocked. This is totally illegal. And they're aware of it. They have the Attorney General's opinion. They all have seen the Attorney General's opinion, which is the government's own lawyer, stating in 2006 categorically that they have no title there and they have no right to be here. Just last month, Zimbabwe's High Court agreed, ruling that Morungay was still legally owned by Cranswick's company, but the government's mining goes on regardless. Diamonds that escape the government's hands are still leaving the country illegally. This man is a diamond smuggler. David Moyo, as we'll call him, has a cache of gems hidden in his shoes. He buys them from military syndicates and scrounging locals and takes them across the border to Mozambique. Dateline travelled with him to see how it's done. 
Uh, these days, yes, the borders are tight, but you know, at times, even if they caught you, you normally these police officers, they need something, then they know that you can, you can pass, you can just give them a bribe and go through. Smuggling of diamonds and gold is at such rampant levels that last year Zimbabwe estimated it was losing revenue worth more than 50 million US dollars a month. David Moyo has crossed this border countless times in the past two years. <laughs> There are growing calls for Zimbabwe's government to be held to account for both small and large-scale smuggling and human rights abuses. Critics say Zimbabwe must be suspended from the Kimberley process, the international body charged with stopping the trade in conflict diamonds. If, though, Zimbabwe is, is expelled from the, Zimb the, the Kimberley process, if it no longer has the right to sell its diamonds, uh, it will be losing one of its key economic lifelines. And there's no question that at that stage, Robert Mugabe will have to take action. He will have to rein in his military on um, the killing, the beating, the forced labor will have to stop. Kimberley Process members visited Morungay in July this year, collecting this photographic evidence along the way. Next month, they will decide whether Zimbabwe's right to export diamonds should be suspended. But some members, like Cecilia Gardner, say the massacre allegations won't be the ultimate decider. It is, it's not a subject that the Kimberley process can really grapple with. We, we don't have the expertise, we don't have the experience, and um, it's just simply not on our uh, list of priorities. The Kimberley process has to show that it's tough. It has not shown that it's tough in the past, and here's another example of of, 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 of weak need behaviour in, in the face of obvious problems. Ian Smiley was a founding member of the Kimberley process, but he believes it's failing. Recently he resigned in despair, and now he fears the Kimberley process won't act against Zimbabwe. The whole point of the Kimberley process was to stop blood diamonds. To ignore this, to ignore this most obvious example of, of, of the kind of things the Kimberley process was supposed to stop, uh, it'll damage its integrity in a most serious way. But Smiley also has another damning allegation, that Australian officials have been actively working to prevent Zimbabwe's suspension. As I understand it, members of the Australian Diplomatic Corps have visited uh, the governments of countries that had team members on the review team that went to Zimbabwe in June and have tried to dissuade them from uh, action that would include the suspension of Zimbabwe from the Kimberley process. He believes Australian diplomats are trying to protect the exports from one of Zimbabwe's other diamond mines, the Maroa mine, which is 78% owned by Australian company Rio Tinto. I was well, I should say, I, I, I'm, I'm old enough that I shouldn't be surprised, but I, I was actually quite stunned that you would allow commercial interests to trump human rights or even to trump the long-term best interests of the diamond industry, I think is, to me, it's unfathomable. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade says it hasn't yet finalised Australia's position. And while it's been talking to other governments, it denies recommending they act in a particular way. While wrangling over Zimbabwe's status as a legitimate diamond dealer continues, so too does the smuggling, with the collusion of those meant to stop it. David Moyo is now in Mozambique and on his way to the house of a well-known diamond buyer with his stash of gems. Thank you, thank you. Unless international authorities act soon, the diamond wealth that could transform the country will continue to fall into the wrong hands and be smuggled away.